Hello, good afternoon. Hope y'all were able to get some lunch. Um, thank you for coming. So this talk is the just some advice on how to write a pen test report. And are you guys able to hear me in the back? Okay, oh, awesome. Okay, so uh, my name's Shelby Pettit. I work in application security and um, at Adobe. I have a really niche role, which is cool, that gives me an opportunity to read pen test reports written from um, re pen testers across the globe. It's really fun. Um, I've seen them from big firms, small firms, um, India, China, US. It's been really fun. Um, so that's kind of where I'm drawing from my experience, sharing some of my, uh, my opinions on what makes a pen test report useful or clunky, in my opinion, or sparse. Um, so hopefully that is helpful, but I will say, sorry, I'm kind of struggling with the presentation format, but I will say I am not a pen tester, so I will not have tons of uh, really practical tips on the actual logistics of writing the pen test, so apologies for that. Um, who's this talk for? Mostly pen testers. Um, there's going to be some overlap for red teamers, but since their objectives are a little bit different in, the, in their, uh, what they're trying to achieve, there, there'll be some overlap, but that's not the main focus here. Um, so maybe some of you, I, if I ask people to raise their hands, who went, who decided to become a pen tester because they like writing? No one's gonna raise their hand. Um, I get that. Uh, but here are just a couple quotes that help us realize that the pen test report is important because um, the people who are your clients, um, that's, that's their only tangible deliverable. You know, out of this whole engagement, all they have is the report to show for it. Um, so we've gotta make sure that that represents the quality of the work that you're doing on the back end and everything that goes into that. So let's get into the planning phase of it. Um, first thing we wanna talk about is what's the objective? Why were you hired to do this job? Um, there, there actually might be a couple of reasons. The most common is usually for like compliance sake. Um, so it's, it's nice to know this background because if they hired you for one purpose and, and you're kind of focused on the assessment and you don't understand what their goal is, you might miss it because they might have something different in mind. You know, maybe it's for compliance requirements. It can help to have some familiarity with those compliance requirements. Um, I definitely don't want to tell you to claim to be uh, a consultant in, in in the compliance side if that's not where your expertise is. But a little bit of context can help knowing, like if it's um, if it's in scope for um, what's the like the card payment requirements PCI DSS. Like maybe with that knowledge, you know that usually the networking aspect needs to be in scope. So just a little bit of background can help you out there, but. Um, yeah, don't claim to consult in areas where you don't have expertise. I'm not trying to say that. Um, I'm trying to think of other ideas for why a pen test might happen. They might have internal processes, things that they're looking for, um, or maybe they have a very specific objective in mind that you would only know by asking. So that's, that's a question you should ask the person um, that hires you as you go to prepare for the engagement. Sorry, with my degrees in IT, I can just barely manage a PowerPoint. Okay, so next thing you wanna know is who is your audience? Um, once that report leaves your hands and goes to the customer, who sees that and who cares? Um, usually it's going to be a mix of technical people and non-technical people. Leadership is gonna to wanna to see this oftentimes, so you kinda, of, it's the challenge is you have to write to a mixed audience. Some people are gonna read it from different perspectives. Um, so it's kind of nice to know. Another thing I wrote in here is classification. Um, understand the data classification. They might want you to write some uh, little footer on your report or something to the effect of like confidential only or things like that. Just make sure that you respect the confidences of, your, um, of the person who hired you to do this job. Um, that will help in instill some trust, make sure that you handle the data according to a way that they feel comfortable with. Next thing is timing. Um, 
it's I'm sure it's very challenging as a as a pen tester. You've got a million and one tasks to do in the in the course of this assessment, um, and just don't forget to leave some time for that report. Um, so yeah, just maybe plan on it taking a little longer than you think to make sure it's polished and time to go, even though we have these tight time boxed assessments. Next thing is format. Um, I have a lot of opinions on this. I've seen pen test reports come in many different formats. Most typically it's like a Word document or a PDF. Either of those is really fine. Um, my only, my, my big feeling is I need to be able to copy paste out of your report. Um, some, some clients might request a CVS, um, or sorry, CSV. Um, that way they can ingest it into whatever ticket managing system they're using or data tracking. Um, so they might give you specifications to please submit your data in this format. Separately from a CSV requirement, I personally do not like pen test reports in Excel format. And unless if your client requests it, right? Client is king, but um, the, the reason I have this bias against uh, pen test reports in Excel is I don't want to have to carry around a screen this big with me to read all of the text in every little cell. That's, that's kind of clunky for me, not my favorite. Maybe some people say, yeah, but I like that I can tabulate the results quickly in the cells. Well, yeah, I guess that's a point, but um, actually, this is just kind of for kicks and giggles. Uh, I have seen uh, visuals like this before in reports. I'm like, thank you, they're really helpful. Um, it's not a bad idea to include some visuals in your report. I think management, uh, their eyes tend to go toward the graphs and things like that. That can be helpful. Uh, don't use a 3D graph like I threw in here. It's kind of corny. But yeah, that's what I have to say for format. Um, moving on to th the structure. So you you have the liberty to, to structure it the way you want. This is my recommendation, what I think is a nice flow. You'll have a cover page, and you're going to slap your firm's beautiful logo right on there, nice and big, and, and a title of what was assessed. Um, on your executive summary, so there are a number of things, and I don't know where my notes went. Let me see if I can find my notes. That will help me. So in the executive summary, basically, we want to keep this to a page or less. This is a summary of what you found. You, even though it's showing up early in the report, you're going to write this last, most likely. And um, you, so at a, quick, at a quick glance, the reader should be able to know a couple things right off the, off the bat. They should know how many of each findings were found, categorized by severity. They should know um, that's not something you want to search for in the report. If you have a 10-page or a 20-page report, you don't want to search for that. You, they just want that to stand right out. Next thing is um, you, can, you can show a distribution by category or um, by severity, whatever makes sense for you. Um, also a summary, if you saw some trends, like maybe there's a, a particular area of security, like um, you need more input sanitiz sanitization or, um, or more network segmentation. If you start to see some trends that popped up, this would be a good place to write a sentence or two, like, hey, here's some things we saw, here's some areas for you to focus on as you go to improve the security posture of your organization. Um, so that's good to know. You can also throw in, if there's like a very blaring or severe finding, you can mention that here too, specifically, just quickly. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll add a little bit more detail to the executive summary later. Moving to the table of contents, Personally, if you can put a, a bullet point in the table of contents for each one of the findings so I can click on the link and it takes me to that part of the report, I love that. It just makes my heart happy. Um, the findings are the real meat of the report. That's where the good stuff goes. Um, so you're, you want to list it from most severe to least severe. So that's how you're going to categorize them. Um, and we'll go into details for what to include per finding later. It, so, so far at this method, we've gone from general to more specific, we're going, um, we're kind of drilling down. So starting at summary and down into the nitty gritty de details. Um, so if, if there's something that starts to get really bulky, but it's relevant information, you can pull that out separately and throw it as Appendix A or Appendix B. That's no problem. That helps uh, the readability of your report. Um, there's, there's some judgment calls, but I'm, I'm sure whatever you organize will be nice. Um, one more comment about structure. There's one particular style that kind of drives me crazy, 
And that's when your summary is big. If you've got three pages of summary, that's not a summary and I don't want to see it because all of a sudden half of your findings are, or half of the details of a finding are in the summary. And then later on in the report, we have the other half of it. And that's messy to jump back and forth. Give me a succinct summary and then I can go find the de all of the details together in the findings section. Um, so that's just the, an opinion I have about that. Do, do, do. Moving on to the next part. Here are a couple more details of things that need to be included in the executive summary. Um, and honestly, if you want to include these details somewhere else because that makes sense to you, that's fine. My preference is to put it in the executive summary, except for maybe the definitions or framework. If that starts to get detailed or hefty, you can toss that into the appendix, no problem. So you definitely need to include the scope um, that might be URLs, um, IP ranges, things like that, or uh, a scope of the, the application that you covered. A description is fine too, whatever works, makes sense for the assessment. The objective, you know the objective, the person who hired you did, now you want to make sure that that's communicated clearly to whoever the reader is, so they understand that we're all on the same page here, that you met that objective. Um, you also want to have this, the start date of the test and the end date, the methodology. Did you use a white box assessment, gray box, black box, and whatever else? Those definitions are kind of nebulous, so whatever else uh, is helpful context, you can throw that in there too. If you followed a particular pen test framework, such as um, like the OWASP guide to securing web apps, or um, like PCIs, or the CIS benchmarks, those, those are really helpful to put in there because that's a reference that people can uh, understand exactly what was tested. Um, you might also have a set of definitions. Um, maybe the way that you define or use certain terms is specific and you wanna get that clear there. That's really helpful. I've seen tables of definitions included in appendices and that's fine. Um, where that's really helpful can be with severity rankings, especially because everyone might have different opinions about what should be considered a critical or a low uh, or anything in between. So definitions can be helpful there. Um, the last thing we have here is assumptions. So um, go back with me a few years to when, or many years to when you were in high school physics and your textbook told you to imagine a world with no air resistance and um, and things like that, you know, no air resistance, gravity is the same as Earth's. Those are assumptions, these underlying assumptions that we make going into the, into the, uh, the assessment. You, maybe it doesn't represent the real world entirely, but these are assumptions that you've been told to or um, have incorporated into your test. That's fine. Those would be appropriate to include in the test so they understand um, your approach. So any questions so far? Keep going. Awesome. Okay, so findings. Um, each finding should include a title. This can be simple, cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting or something like that. Um, you also wanna have a tracking number. Um, Companies tend, to, I, I don't know how it's used internally to pen test firms, but I have seen a, a trend of everyone assigning kind of like this uh, tracking number, you know, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, or something like that to every single finding they have. That way there's, there's no uh, mistake about which finding we're referencing in our discussions and things like that. Um, so they have a tracking number, whatever works for you. Also severity ranking. Um, Different organizations have different preferences, um, different risk appetites and approaches. So whatever they and you can agree on as, a, as an appropriate way to assess, because you don't want to give just a report of your findings without this layer of analysis. You need to prioritize for them. Do that analysis. As a security professional, I'm telling you to focus on this and this, and then if you have time, also that, that, and that, right? So you wanna help them prioritize. That's the point of the severity ranking. 
Um, if you're taking a risk-based approach, um, CVS SV3 is great. Um, or I've seen scales critical, high, medium, low, and informational. That's great too. You can define what those look like from a risk impact perspective in your appendix. Um, priority one, priority two, um, I've seen banks use this kind of status. They've got those defined on their side and then they, they slap that label on so everyone knows this is how we handle P1s, this is how we handle P2, things like that. And the, and the SLA is kind of associated with that. Um, so that's kind of severity. Oh, I guess there's, there's another approach. There's also um, the adversary-based approach. So there's like, you can have a risk-based approach or an adversary-based approach. Um, as long as you're consistent and you can defend why you put a certain label on there, um, that is just fine. But there can be some, some differences in opinions with, with severity ranking, and it might depend on your organization, and that's fine. Next, you're gonna need a description of the vuln. So not everyone who reads your report, in fact, I would even say the majority of the people who read your pen test report probably are not security professionals. Some are, but you're, you're probably, some, at the end of the day, a sysadmin or an, a, an ops person, is engineer, is going to get this report and be told to fix things. And so you can't take for granted that if you throw out these terms, these jargon that we, that we talk about in the security world, that they're gonna know exactly what you're saying. So you just add a sentence or two that explains this is what this finding means, in, in, just in simple terms, because not everyone's gonna know that, but you can put it in terms that they understand. Um, just, this doesn't have to be huge. A description of the vuln can be a couple sentences, maybe a small paragraph or two. And that's, I think that's really helpful. Even, even for people that work in this, it's nice to have a little refresher, make sure we're just talking about the same thing on the same page. Next is explanation of impact. So you've explained what you found, now so what? Why should we care about this? Um, you, make sure you differentiate what you were able to prove versus what is potentially um, the impact here. As much as you can as a pen tester, um, it's great to show the impact actually demonstrated so that it becomes, it comes out of this theoretical realm and into the, look, for real, we actually did this. Here's a screenshot, right? Um, so that's what the, the explanation of impact, if you're not able to, to show that full attack chain, you can throw the theoretical stuff in there. Just make sure it's stated appropriately so they understand what was done and what was really discovered. Steps to reproduce. Um, I find that this is most often the part of a pen test that's lacking. Um, so this is, once, once again, keeping in mind that um, an engineer who may not have a background in security is going to have to try to reproduce your finding in order to successfully patch against it, right? So they've got to do what you did. So you have to give them instructions. You've got to give them a recipe. You use this tool, you navigate to this tab of the tool and click this and type that and it's gonna give you the result here. And, and you walk them through it. I think that's so helpful. It might feel wordy to you or maybe unnecessary, but I think as someone who consumes the reports and, and has this back and forth with the engineers, it's really helpful. Um, it helps us understand exactly what you did. Um, so that we can not waste too much time trying to rebuild what you've already discovered. Last thing is evidence. Um, evidence kind of shows, it, it could be a screenshot or a video share of what you managed to capture, what you managed to do. Um, evidence is not always complete without those steps to reproduce. I kind of think of the evidence as like the end point and the steps to reproduce as like the journey, how you got there. And I, we are running low on time. So affected location, the URL, the endpoint, the IP address, the file name, whatever it was, list all of them. If, 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 you're, if, time, if you have time enough in your assessment to identify every location where it's vulnerable within scope, that's way more helpful than just saying, it's all over. Um, if it's a universal setting, maybe they can go fix it. But sometimes, depending on the, the remediation that's required, they might have to go and do it for each location. So it's nice to have that all listed out, every affected location, 
recommended remediation, if you're able to give more than one remediation, that's so helpful because we, you know, we get to the engineering side and we say, here's our recommendation. They say, we can't do that. It's working as designed. We're like, okay, well, here's our backup recommendation and our backup backup recommendation. Maybe you won't fix the whole, maybe you won't patch the whole vulnerability with this third backup, but it gives them options. You know, this is better than doing nothing. So I like to tier my recommendations, have multiple approaches for fixing it. You have your best practice and then maybe your backups. Now that you know, I've given you like a whole laundry list of things that you need to be documenting, you know ahead of time, so you try to document as you go. Um, take notes of your progress, of your process. Um, capture screenshots as you go so that you don't have to try to figure out at the end of the week what you did. And I know some people do set up logging to capture their, um, their traffic that helps them get that information later. So here's just a quick example we're gonna run through. Um, I borrowed this from SANS. Um, you can ignore that red box. That's just for their demonstration thing. But I like that they have, um, here we can see their severity, the, their threat level, the vulnerability analysis. If, if we followed the, the template I gave you, I would na name analysis maybe like the description and then maybe add another header here toward the bottom that says like steps to reproduce. Um, but yeah, here we have screenshots. They've labeled their screenshots, which is really nice. They labeled this one figure six, getting shell access. So if you just look at the screenshot or the, the label on the screenshot, it's very helpful. It tells you exactly what they did. Um, one thing I would add, if you want to just kind of make it a little bit more polished, I would highlight, um, after you take the screenshot, put a little red box around the part of the screenshot that's interesting. They don't, you know, people are going to look at this and be like, okay, that's a lot of text, what? So if you put that little red box, it draws their eyes to the right spot. That's really helpful for me. Once again, I, I do appreciate that they highlighted the right row here. They're showing that they have Netcat running, that they're able to install that and get it going. Um, and then here, after, the, after their walkthrough, they give an impact as well as a recommendation. And they have external resources. Hey, if you want to go do more reading, here's a link. Very helpful. As you are writing, we don't want to use scare tactics, right? Um, try, to, try to take it as an evidence-based approach. What does the data say? Um, and don't go too far from that. It, as you write reports, you're going to find that a lot of it is copy-paste. Um, so you can feel free to build a template or use software that will do that for you um, just to save yourself some time. I find that just a fun little tip, if as you're filling out that template, if you find pieces that you, you're like, oh, I need to come back and fill that in later, put special characters there. Like I, in the past when I'm working on big long reports, I would highlight it, but then you're trusting your visual ch check and that's not foolproof. So put like three asterisks in a row or three, um, dollar signs in a row. And then at, before you submit your report, do a text search for those characters uh, because it should only come up in those spots where you meant to come back later and fill them in, just so you don't forget little things like insert customer name here. In, if you do a white box assessment, um, you'll probably want to collaborate between the rough draft stage and the final report stage so that the engineers and the system, um, like, designers on the customer side can have a chance to explain anything that they might disagree with. And then you can negotiate maybe some finding um, severities might need to be adjusted or things like that based on new evidence that they, that they show. Um, your firm also might have a QA process. Last thing, letter of attestation. Um, this is very similar to an executive summary. You're gonna have a lot of the same details in there. And this is a... Um, this is basically proof that the assessment happened and kind of a, a high-level summary of what the findings. You might not release the name of the findings because they're not patched yet, but this letter can be given to for, for many use cases to show that the pen test happened. Maybe, I don't know how that holds up in audits versus the full report, but like, um, I know I, I work for a software company, and so our customers want to see that proof that we have been doing our due diligence and are doing thorough pen tests. So they, they examine our scope and all those things that are included in that LOA that we're able to share with them externally without sharing the details of all the open vulns, right? So that's really helpful to have that letterhead pretty LOA to share. 
And then last thing, there's lots of software that can help you write good reports, but now that you, I can't recommend any because I haven't used them, but now that I've given you kind of the basics of the ingredients for a good report, you can go out and search for things that make, make sense for you and that work well for you. Um, so yeah, I am out of time. Sorry we don't have time for QA, but thank you. That is all.